So hello everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today on uh, International Mother Language Day here uh, at Humboldt University with our um, super awesome program that we have put together. Thanks to Professor Dr. Nadia Christina Schneider, who's also here today. Thank you so much again to you for uh, this opportunity uh, for me to have this panel discussion. And yeah, today we're going to talk about uh, expressing Merdeka, talk and language identity and artistic activism in the West Papua Liberation Movement. I am incredibly honored to have uh, a guest speaker today who is uh, from West Papua, uh, Rani Kareni. Uh, thank you so much for coming. He's a the diplomat, musician, particular consultant, graduate from uh, ANU. And I am so honored for you uh, to be here, Rani. Thank you so much for coming. Um, so I think first I will um, go on with a, a little presentation about the general topic before um, Ronnie will talk about uh, artistic activism a little more in depth. And then we will have a, a interview and like a question part of the panel. So I hope everything works out like that. Um, so first, I think I'm not sure how uh, well acquainted everyone is with Papua New Guinea, West Papua, Papua New Guinea. So um, we have a broad audience today, I think, uh, from the West Papua uh, network here in Germany, um, as well as people who might not be familiar with the topic, but just generally interested. So uh, let me start off first by kind of clarifying the terminology that we're working with. So if you type in Papua in the Google search engine, this is what the image results will get you. It's mostly pictures of Papuan people. Whereas when you look for New Guinea, you get a more geographical imagery. So usually the island of New Guinea. So and if you put this together, you have Papua New Guinea, which is a sovereign state on the eastern part of the island, whereas West Papua comprises the western part of the island that is part of Indonesia. This is what we're going to what I'm going to explain in a bit. I'm going to give a short recap of the history. But maybe first, why is it important to talk about New Guinea? Why is it important to talk about West Papua? Why are we talking about this today on this day, International Mother Language Day? Well, this island, which is, I think, the third biggest island in the world, is home to 850 languages. It is the, linguist, the most linguistically and culturally diverse place in the world. And just, this is a tiny, like this is the best map that I could find, honestly, to just show the immense um, diversity of languages uh, in, on the New Guinea island. It's small pockets everywhere. And there's not, it's not even one, language family. So we have the most languages in the world in this island, and as well as the most language families. We have about 43 language families. The biggest one is the Trans New Guinea family, but as well as a ton of isolates. And linguists have only started to unravel the mysteries of the New Guinean languages in the past, let's say, 50 years. And there's still so much to do. There could be, yeah, so much more to unravel. So this is, it is important to talk about it, I think, from a linguistic point of view, because I always call it the Garden of Eden of linguistics, because it is just so abundant and rich, just this Garden Eden. Um, of these 850 languages, we found around 414 in West Papua. So the part that we will be uh, talking about today, the part that belongs to Indonesia. Um, the most, but just like to have a, um, just have like a little Im like image of it, is um, Papuan languages are spoken by roughly three to four million people living on the New Guinea island. Um, however, the biggest indigenous Papuan language of Enga spoken in Papua New Guinea has 165,000 speakers. So you can do the math by three to four million speakers and the biggest 
language has 165,000 speakers. A lot of languages only have a handful of speakers and a lot of them also face extinction. That might be due to globalization, but also outside threats like in West Papua, Indonesia and slowly acculturation to Indonesia and their language. So in West Papua, Indonesian is also spoken due to um, the colonization of it. Um, and recently there has also been an emergence of a Malay-based Creole, which is Papuan Malay. Whereas in Papua New Guinea, the lingua franca is Tok Pisin, which is an English-based Creole, as well as Hirimoto, which is an uh, Austronesian-based Creole and English. So this is why I, I thought I deemed it suitable to talk about New Guinea and Papua languages on Mother Language Day, because there's no other place as linguistically and culturally diverse as New Guinea. However, West Papua and the story behind it is rather sad and is something that has been um, interesting for me and really dear to my heart for several years now. Um, just so that we're like everyone kind of on the same level and everyone knows what we're talking about. I made this um, little graph here um, to give a super short recap over um, the West Papuan history. So West, the area of New Guinea and Australia was settled around uh, 40,000 years before BC um, by ancestors of, of indigenous Australians and Melanesians. This is important to understand for the following history and the conflict that we have today in West Papua, because it is ethnically and culturally very different, very different people. So whereas in Indonesia, we have Austronesians in Melanesia, as the name says, Australia, New Guinea and other islands, we have indigenous Melanesians. Um, nothing really happened, people living their lives for 40,000 years unbothered until um, the Dutch came and uh, claimed the western part of the island. Um, there, there was the start of uh, colonial, uh, like truly colonial interests. Before there, there have been Portuguese and Spanish seafarers visiting the island, but the actual colonial exploitation of the island started with the Dutch in 1848. Um, the island of New Guinea was then divided between the Netherlands, Germany, and Great Britain in 1895. You can see a map here. Um, this is also, I think, very interesting for Germans because the German colonialism is uh, always forgotten due to other horrible aspects of our history. But Germany was also um, the biggest colonial power in the uh, South Sea after Great Britain and the third largest colonial power in general. So when talking about West Papua and New Guinea, Germany also has to weigh in, I think, because of our history. In the 1930s, <clears throat> I think it was interesting because in the 1930s, there was a beginning of a West Papuan identity. So Papuan graduates, um, so to promote the idea that there, that there should be a unified West Papuan identity. However, it was also in the 1930s when kind of the downfall of West Papua started with oil companies finding the richest gold and copper deposits on Amungme territory. So this already illustrates how economic interests and colonial interests kind of mark the downfall of uh, West Papuan, uh, Papuan sovereignty. In 1949, this is kind of a secondary but also important history fact is Indonesia became independent. Um, a Javanese central government united 15 um, republic, republics into the United States of Indonesia as we know them today. Um, so, so, um, Simultaneously, in 1949, two Japanese officials also promised easier access to natural resources um, to foreign investors and oil companies and uh, natural resource companies if the Japanese central government would be in charge of the East Indies. So this is what facilitated the independence of Indonesia. 
the Dutch were still very prominent in uh, West Papua at the time. So we have to understand that while Indonesia became independent, West Papua was still uh, a Dutch colony. And it also remained so until the beginning of the 60s. In the 1950s, the Dutch worked together with the Papuan people to establish modern social uh, services and guide, so to say, or like assist them along into the way of independence, which was set to um, be established around uh, the uh, 60s and 70s with the global decolonization age. So plans were afoot for West Papuan independence. Back to the economic interests in 1959, what we witnessed is the construction of the Freeport mine on said territory where we find the world's richest gold and copper deposits. So this mine is still alive and well today. It is um, horrible what is being done to the environment. I think we could just do an entire uh, talk about the destruction of the environment and nature in West Papua due to um, uh, extracting natural resources. But it's also, um, it's also um, a uh, symbol of the humanitarian rights crises that we face in West Papua. I think um, maybe there's time to talk about this in detail later. In 1961, together with the plans that were set to make Papua sovereign and an independent state. Um, the West New Guinea Council is uh, elected a parliament that was supposed to be in force by April 61. They also select a hymn, um, Papua, Oh, my land Papua. And, um, and, um, and no, not selected him, then anthem selected him with a flag. I'm sorry, I put it wrong in the, <laughs> in the presentation. So it's like the hymn, as I mentioned, and they selected the flag, the morning star flag, which you can see here on the slides. On December 1st, 1961, and this is a, a very key factor and key element in West Papua history, the morning star flag was raised, and this still um, we consider it as like the national day, so to speak, for West Papua, since it is the first uh, like official raise, since it's been the first like proclamation of the West Papuan state and nation. Um, Indonesia's interest in the region grew as well as foreign interests in, uh, in the region due to natural resources. Um, starting in 1962, there have been several attempts by Indonesia to invade West Papua. Um, this is where it starts like becoming a little fuzzy, but so basically what happened is that the US blackmailed the Netherlands into signing the New York Agreement, which would transfer West Papua to Indonesia. Indonesia um, had, had an interest in this region for like obviously um, economic reasons, as well as their propaganda of a united Indonesia and freeing the Papuans from Dutch colonization without, yeah, without providing any evidence for that. In 1965, after ongoing brutal abuse by Indonesian military, Papuans started to organize themselves in the OPM, in the organization Papua Freedom. So beginning in the 60s, with both horrible human rights abuses, invasion by Indonesia, and growing, um, in growing um, blackmail and um, some, uh, oppression by uh, the US, um, there was a growing Papuan uh, indigenous interest in um, resistance, so to speak. Um, the UN was also um, in, in obviously invested in this conflict since um, well, the, the UN. <laughs> However, they said that so indigenous people do have the right to self 
uh, governance and self sovereignty. And they said there should be an act like um, a referendum to be taken place in 1969, which was called the Act of Free Choice, where Papuans was Papuans were called to vote whether to remain in Indonesia or to become an independent nation. This referendum, however, was a sham vote because 1,025 handpicked Papuans were forced and blackmailed by Indonesian military to vote for the remaining in Indonesia. So they were um, being threatened if not to vote for the, for, to remain in Indonesia, they could face severe consequences. There was violence inv involved. You can see a picture here of like rioting against this act of no choice as uh, we call it by Indonesian military. So after this act of free choice where obviously everyone, um, everyone uh, <clears throat> uh, voted for remaining in Indonesia, fearing the consequences, the UN approved of this act of free choice of this referendum. So this is why ever since there has been like a ongoing dissatisfaction with the UN, understandably, because West Papuans have been robbed by their uh, opportunity to self-govern. Um, ever since, so basically from the end point of view, everything was kind of settled, but ongoing human rights abuses by Indonesian military were going on ever since the 70s um, until today. And just to kind of illustrate what happened uh, regarding human rights abuses, in 1977, there was a, um, a military operation called the Koteka Operation. Um, the Koteka is um, a penis skirt worn by Highland uh, people in uh, West Papua. And it was called like that because it was both a um, military uh, operation, um, including napalm bombings and uh, killings and horrible, horrible um, things, but also more uh, of like an of like an acculturation process and and like a um, dehumanizing kind of a, a dehumanizing practices of um, forbidding the men to wear the koteka which was also meant to emasculate them because a lot um i have i have i have heard that most like in most indonesians although they especially in, in, in indonesian military despite their growing like interest and um military force in the region some claim they're still basically scared of melanesia of, Papuans because they're just so culturally different from them. So what they did in with the Koteka operation and other dehumanizing practices is emasculating them and um, acculturating them to Javanese culture because it is it is just so so foreign to them, which again I think underlines the dichotomy that we have there of like true like colonialism because it's basically not like Indonesia and what's up was not the same at all but anyways so yeah there was like a, a bunch of um military operations um trying to account a culture people uh, people from Papua to Japanese culture like killing killing the pigs and stuff um this just could go on and on we have an ongoing humanitarian rights crisis in West Papua, which also um, sparked again in 2019 with uprisings uh, by Papuans across the archipelago and um, the entire world when uh, Papuan students were racially attacked in Surabaya, um, being called racial slurs, um, with, yeah, with demonstrations all around the archipelago and the world of uh, West Papuans fighting for the freedom, fighting for the sovereignty, resisting uh, the human, human rights abuse that they have to endure. And also after the uh, killing of uh, George Floyd in 2020, there's also been the emergence of Papuan Lives Matter. So I think in the most recent years, there's definitely been more 
talk about this also in the media and I mean this is how I got a hold of it so I think there's a growing interest and um, yeah I think the world is slowly starting to notice that yeah this is just the horrible history of West Papua which also leads us to well resistance what forms of resistance is there and this should be the segue now to Ronnie um, I think he will do a, a much better job explaining this <laughs> than me. But yeah, as I said, there's just been growing interest and demonstrations all over the world. Um, you can see a, a rally in Melbourne here. Um, you can also see me in front of the Brandenburg Gate uh, on December 1st last year for the anniversary of uh, 60 years of uh, the Rise of the Morning Star flag. There's books. Uh, written by uh, Papuans who suffered um, political imprisonment, like Philip Karma, uh, music, film festivals. So there's a growing, um, like a, I think, a strong community of resistance in West Papua. And I would love for you, Ronnie, to get into this and enlighten us and talk a little about, bit about this. Many thank you. Uh, Sydney for the the history and the context pretty much to um, set the scene and makes my um, discussion a bit much more easier now to um, just transition into it so yeah big thank you um, before I go any further I wanted to take this opportunity to really uh, um, acknowledge um, everyone in this space, I'm speaking to you from the Nanowal country of the First Nation people here um, in Australia, um, Canberra, where um, I'm speaking to you and I want to pay respect to their elders, past, present and emerging. Um, just like many indigenous people around the world were um, in West Papua case, we continue to fight for land rights and basic human dignity. And so it's timely as well with the, um, the theme of the discussion on the mother's language and linking it with present day um, struggle where West Papua is um, going through. So with that, I will um, going to share my screen. And I'm sure you guys can see this now, yep. All right. So my role basically, um, as uh, Sydney already introduced, I play a role more within the music and cultural um, spaces, um, although within the diplomatic spaces where I have been engaged through the, the leadership um, that forms the unified body with outside of the West Papua, where we continue to amplify and echo the voice of the people of West Papua. So based here in Australia, I carry out the Pacific mission for United Liberation Movement for West Papua. And our leader based in the UK, Benny Wenda, and we have um, other diplomats, Oridek Up um, is the mission to the European Union. And there's also uh, Herman Wangai to the UN um, in New York and myself um, to the Pacific. And, and so that's one aspect, but music has been um, the weapon that I continues to um, use or as a medium. Um, in the, I'm in a band called Sorong Samurai. And I will go into that and talk about some of the projects uh, that we do, um, but also at the same time, um, um, acknowledging that the yeah, people that I work with, and as you see in this image, it's that drum there. Uh, we call it Tifa in Papua. Um, in, on the other side of the island, it's called Kundu. And the people of Torres Strait uh, Islands um, call it Warup. So that is a drum from Torres Strait Island with a Torres Strait Islander. He's a dancer, but also a, a, yeah, a, a, a Kundu player. 
and we use the the the, the sound of tifa or the metaphor of tif, tifa as the the harder you beat the drum, the louder it becomes in terms of the resistance um, on the ground with West Papua and with solidarity with the people of West Papua. So um, with West Papua itself, as uh, Sydney already highlighted with many tribal um, languages and the groupings uh, and over 250 tribal languages, um, it is um, broken into seven customary territory. And from where I come from, it's Saireri. So it's an island just off the mainland. As you could see here on the map, um, there's uh, two islands, one called Biak and the other one Serui. So that is where I come from, um, the island of Serui and from the, the grouping of the Saireri people. And there is also that set other, um, other uh, six. At the moment, under the current Indonesian special autonomy framework, which has already been uh, pushed through the parliament July last year, uh, there is two provinces, West Papua and Papua. But at the moment, they are pushing for five provinces. And so there's already a pushback from the, the customary council, the Papuan People's Assembly, even the provincial parliament in Papua have already pushed back on this um, division of the province into five. And they also talk about sixth province. And a lot of this is based on the resources that um, the interest, the geopolitical, geostrategic, economic interest with each of these um, provinces. So um, that is something that is developing at the moment. And in the next couple of days, um, there'll be massive actions coming out from West Papua to protest against this breakup of um, uh, Papua region from uh, two provinces into six. And now the island, Sorong is the Western tip and Samarai is the Eastern tip of that island of New Guinea. And when we talk about language, we, it's about following the kinship, following the sound of the drum, this tifa drum, as you could see on the bottom left, um, how that tr sound travels. And that's how we identify ourselves within uh, the cultural context. And that is very critical for any uh, first nations and uh, people that are connected with the land and the language. So it also travels. So for, for me as a, as, a, as a drum player, I follow the sound as well. And so even I am out away from homeland, I know that um, it's me, I represent Papua and Papua is in me. And so that's the message I continue to echo that as well. So, and through the, that, the, we have this band called Sorong Samurai. So that's uh, the band, uh, you can check it out. I'll share some of our uh, work here, but um, that's how we identify this band. And this band focused mostly about uh, cultural revival, the identity and strengthening of that. And also looking at the culture, contemporary issues, social justice, um, not only on, in West Papua, but also within the region, um, addressing that even on um, land, land rights. As um, Sydney already given the background, I won't go into that a lot, but um, what I'm just gonna touch it is that West Papua is a matter of political and legal um, debate within the international, uh, under the international law. And so this is something that um, at the moment, since Indonesia occupied West Papua uh, through the brutal force um, and exploited the UN mechanism to really um, um, take West Papua. And so this is where in terms of self exercising right to self-determination and if one continues, uh, 
a grouping of people continues to fight for that, then it has to be fought within the UN system because that's how the manner in which Indonesia occupied the region when West Papua was a, a non-self-governing territory listed through the uh, UN Trusteeship Council. Um, but at the moment, it is very difficult to get that through. So if there are any law students, um, I'm putting it out there, that West Papua needs a lot of um, legal minds to really argue um, Indonesia's um, argument around uti posidetis, that territorial integrity, which at the time it used that to uh, take over West Papua. And so the right to self-determination that West Papua meant to go through that, to achieve that in the in 70s did not eventuate it. So that's on that. and so. Um, that legal um, case as well within that. So just, uh, yeah, putting it there. Um, in West Papua at the moment, um, right now, the movement building capacity is one of the main uh, focus amongst the youth. And so the 2019 uprising um, demonstrated a lot of the, the pushback and also the, the issue, how it has kind of gone through the next generation. And so, this particular photo here that I've um, choose here is one of the sister, uh, Sayang Mandabayan, speaking at the rally last year um, in continuing to um, call to um, reject the special autonomy framework, but also um, free Victor Yemo. He's one of the highest prominent um, activists and um, civil leaders. Today, um, here, in, in West or like in West Papua, he appeared again, he appeared in court after being captured or arrested in May of last year. And the outcome from the trial today is that he is found guilty for orchestrating the anti-racism rally, which Sydney has highlighted earlier in the in the timeline. And so that shows how much that um, the state repression on peaceful activists and um, just the freedom of expression and assembly. So this is one of the key areas that um, in terms of resistance, the movement building capacity on the ground is also um, key amongst the youth. And so the concept or the, the hope of solidarity and capacity building is critically important as well. Um, as well as education and training and there's objectives here, I'm just, going through and this particular photo, um, this is just a recent uh, a recent uh, workshop by this uh, the educator, Papuan educator, um, Martin Manga Pro, where um, organizing the leadership and nonviolent, uh, yeah, organizing workshop on based on resistance leaders, leaders and uh, nonviolence um, strategies. And on the second day, on the eighth, um, the police have to come and stop them. And they're doing this in the church uh, building. And so they have to stop. And they came back on the third day um, to continue that. So it shows how much that enthusiasm, even under massive surveillance, um, people, a lot of the youth find ways to continue to um, um, organize and mobilize. And, and so it's great that it's happening. Um, and media advocacy and, pro, uh, and propaganda, is, it's one of the key area now, like the state disinformation that is coming out um, to, to, tell, to really spread bots on the social media by state-sponsored uh, bots, basically. So this is one key area as well when the media blackout um, on what is happening on the ground. So it's one thing that um, youths on the ground are keen to really build these online publications and they, um, you know, calling for volunteers or people with graphic design background to engage. So that's that um, on what's happening in West Papua. Um, about Sorong Samurai and music as resistance. Um, this is the band that I perform with and, and what we do is we celebrate the, our, our, our culture through the songs, through the dance and a lot of the songs as well, it's hip hop and the rap and it's, it's in language like mother's tongue. Um, and then also in Tokpisin, which uh, yeah, 
earlier on mentioned by um, Sydney and also in English. And we do also, you could see that screen, it's the, those drums, the traditional instruments mixed with the contemporary and our um, the costume that we wear as well and painting as well speaks uh, for itself in terms of like, yeah, the music. And there's a lot of um, drumming as well involved in that, hip hop beats with rapping um, in dialects, um, uh, the chants, the dance. And so that's, I continue to do that. And it is important because um, for West Papua where in the seventies, when Indonesia occupied the language, even just to play the drum it, um, was stopped. So this is one way we as, an, as a third generation into the, the struggle to keep the, the culture alive. That's one way to really maintaining that and using big up spaces that I, I, I am able to, to really demonstrate that. Um, about the music of resistance, um, it's, as I said, uh, that's the kundu. This is a Papuan kundu from the island of Biak. And which I've already like the Kundu name and in Tokpisin, Warup in Torres Strait. And it's the key importance here is um, to, to demonstrate that from that island, from Sorong to Samurai, we are one people. And it's the colonial boundary, the arbitrary line that separates that kinship system, the, that song lines that we share through the, the sound of that Tifa, through the chants and through uh, that familyhood, the family name, because that's key here. Um, it's in that song lines and bloodlines. And also the sound of this music, it brings unity, community and identity of who we are as Melanesian people within the, the subgrouping here in the region. And of course, with the, with the ongoing fight against, uh, or not against, but in terms of decolonization in this region, it's building that solidarity. So uh, one of the um, projects, latest projects as well, is Rockin' for West Papua. And so this was um, also convened through the Office of the Free West Papua campaign in, in UK and also throughout um, a lot of the various chapters of the Free West Papua campaign movement. And so the movement that are kind of like engaged through Rise of the Morning Star, um, we build solidarity through that and creating that platform for Rockin' for West Papua. So it was amazing since 2016, uh, 17, 18, 19, to really put support behind and use engaging musicians as you can see here, um, hashtag music is a weapon. And it was amazing to see artists from, whether it's right across like in, the, in South Africa, all the way throughout the Pacific and to US, South America, um, and in between anywhere around the globe in Europe to come together to really um, in solidarity to use music to really amplify those voices. And so um, at the moment we still, wanted to continue to do that with COVID. It, a lot of this um, work hasn't been continued, but as um, Benny uh, quote, um, does ref speaks a lot into West Papua music as a resistance that every song contains a human spirit. And that is within uh, many uh, of the, our Papuan underground, but also those living abroad. Some of the strategic, I think the screen just went frozen on me here. Can you guys see? We can see the title. Yeah, okay. Oh, sorry, ah. I have to press it up. So some of the strategic work that we do as well, it's through various festivals here in the Pacific, Vanuatu, and there was a campaign we did with LASH. So this is something that is of critical importance where while the ongoing human rights abuses are happening on the ground, but building um, strategic partnership. And so that's the, some of the work within just in this, in this region. And I'm sure there is opportunities to really build that and holding governments um, 
accountable as well. Um, one thing that um, is, is commission work um, here in Australia, one of the commission work is through um, organize or put a big um, concept as well. Um, and so that's an opportunity here, um, particularly with Indonesia now lobby through Jakarta, uh, Jakarta lobby through um, uh, Berlin in Germany where two years ago, there was already arms deal uh, between Indonesia and Germany. So this is something that um, a lot of this defense cooperation and military uh, partnerships is it's coming at the cost of um, the indigenous um, and also uh, peaceful activists on the ground where the, the crackdown. So building strategic partnership with um, allies and like-minded um, organizations are also within business or even civil society organizations is critically important in some of the work I do as well. Um, video production. Um, this is some like Sorong Samurai is one of the soundtrack that we drop it on the 1st of December 2016, um, which made waves in West Papua and within this region um, to just capture basically the movement that we um, addressing. And also, um, if people remember Skittles and tea mix, um, there was the, the killing of one of the um, Black American um, youth. And so we build solid solidarity with some of the Krampus in the US uh, and use the music, I really like it, music with uh, the, the video um, representing some of the um, street um, Krampus in the US and some of the founders as well uh, of the, the, that movement, cramping movement. And so that's true with that uh, strengthening solidarity. Stage production of some of the things I do as well. Um, there are a few images here, and this is mostly here in around this region and Australia. Um, we did a, have a co commission work through the um, Arts Centre here in Melbourne, and that was one of our first gig, and it was also commissioned through the government. And we just label our 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 group a rebel music, and then over the years. That's how it became um, Sorong Samurai to really capture the, the, the artists that we come from that one land. Um, the image on the top left here, Warm, warm Adelaide, um, this year in March, next month, we'll be going to um, back to this stage and showcase exactly what we did um, in 20, 2014, um, this was one of the performance back at the, on the stage and we, we will amplify again, once again, um, through those traditional instruments, through those um, dialects in rapping and bringing that course again. So um, back to that stage at the WOMED later. I know there is the WOMED UK and WOMED New Zealand, and we hope to come there one day if there's uh, the international borders open and to be able to come and um, take this music um, to Europe. Um, so at this stage, this is some of our, our um, performance here in Australia. We also have CD compilation, um, to compilation, and compilation basically uh, donate or the contributors are the artists um, um, around, the, around the world and as well as within this region. And so we are in our third compilation um, coming up. Um, to engage artists. So in volume one, we had uh, Michael Franti um, and some of the artists here. And, and in volume two, Yotu Yindi, one of the big uh, band from Australia, it's um, in the 70s, 80s, that really um, championed the treaty uh, project with here in, in Australia and Big Mountain from US, and so that's that. Um, I, I know the time, so I'm just gonna play this a bit of what we do. So it gives you a, a sense of the, the sound and on stage performance that I, I talked about, Sorong Samurai, and then happy to open it for um, discussion. So here's a minute uh, video. Yeah, 
Thank you. Thank you so much, Ronnie. This was truly inspiring. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, I think definitely I have a ton of questions <laughs> and I think I would um, just go ahead and ask and um, definitely open for any questions from the other audience, but maybe I'll start. So what, um, it was like impressive to see how much can be done through music and how much you're uh, also doing. Um, I would like to know like how much of your art and your music is perceived in West Papua and um, you know um, across uh, maybe the Australian exile and uh, in Indonesia since there's also uh, sometimes uh, media control and uh, internet being cut in West Papua. So how much of um, this is being received and perceived in West Papua. Yeah, well, firstly, in terms of um, how much that has perceived, like it is well received, like in 20, 2012, one of the track, were, it's a remix reggae by um, PNG renowned artist, George Stalak. And when that song came out within the one first month, it became the most downloadable song throughout West Papua. And it only shows like Indonesia, but when you go through the details, it was accessed on the YouTube, like but through the um, social media platform, mostly uh, YouTube. And so that's demonstrated in terms of how that is received in West Papua. And when we dropped that soundtrack, Sorong Samurai in 2016, it became one of the rally um, song um, that really when activists go out to the street, they play that music because um, it has that cultural sound to it, um, to um, Sorong Samurai um, song. Um, and so people use that to go down to the streets to march with. And so that really shows how, how much uh, it's well received uh, on the ground. And not only that, the youths themselves, um, we've engaged with Papuan youths. And first, um, in the case of one of the um, artists where he, see, he raps in Bahasa on stage in that video, at first he was very scared. He was like, if I'm going to come on the tour with um, the band, I'm, I'm scared to go back. And he expressed that in the beginning. But after the performance and he went back, lay low, even he was a person of interest that they wanted to find out where he is and like the, the tour, but that didn't stop him. The confidence in him um, inspired many of the youths in West Papua as well. So now there is a hip hop community where it's about conscious lyrics, um, not of just like, yeah, and also understanding the hip hop culture as well and how that has played a big role in why um, the lyrics is very important. So we see there's a surge in that. And the influence particularly as well within the region in Papua New Guinea, where musicians started to writing songs about solidarity and that trans transcends across the Pacific, um, where artists in the region writing songs in solidarity, like Free West Papua songs and chants. So we're seeing that grows a lot 
from what we do. So that really gives um, strength and hope for what, and also knowing that, yeah, uh, what we do. Also, um, the state, the government has response or responded to some of those um, things that we do. So I, in particular, do receive some threatening like messages or phone call um, just just to let me know that Ed, like what I'm doing, they're following it very closely. And, and that goes back in 2013. So I, I started kind of like, yeah, getting those threats, but that only shows that what we're doing has, 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 has got their attention. So it doesn't stop, us, stop me or many of our band members, um, even from Papua New Guinea, a lot of these artists also got threats, but it only makes them feel that the freedom of expression is has some meaning. It's not that just the word, um, you know, freedom of expression or what you write and sing, but there's a cause behind it. So yeah, it's it's amazing um, to really see how it's well received, firstly on the ground and um, inspired a lot of youths. Definitely, I think definitely there's always uh, two sides of the medal, right? Um, obviously, like these threats, um, it's uh, it's horrible. That's Things, things like that happen, but um, as you said, it also kind of fuels your uh, even more resistance. And it's good to hear that there's such a good reception. Uh, maybe speaking of um, uh, rapping in Bahasa and the reception in Indonesia, what would you say is like the the what is the relation of West Papuans with the Malay language? Like, is it how, because I mean I think you're using it as well in music to express uh, merdeka freedom, uh, as, but it's also the language of the oppressor. Maybe you could go into that. I think that this would be very interesting. Yeah, well, because of um, what happened in the 70s when we were um, like my, fam my, my parents and um, those before me, when they were forced. And so that was really this, the guided democracy under Suharto regime very much stopped anyone from speaking. So the movement went into this underground, kind of like uh, clandestine way to really galvanize and mobilize the, the, the movement and resistance itself. And what actually happened in the 60s where the musicians and um, in the 60s went around and collect songs and in language, like in chants and, um, one of the brothers and families now living in the Netherlands, um, the Up family, Oridek Up and the family. So their dad, um, he's one of was Papua's musicologists and anthropologists, went around and collected the songs in the 70s in the tribal language and archived them at the um, National um, University, Chandrawasi University. And so whether it's in the the one of the like Animha uh, group, which is the Southern part or Lapago um, customary area or Mimika or where I come from the Saireri region. He collected those songs and those songs, basically what he did is to keep the, the culture alive, the language alive. So like I am very appreciative of that, uh, what he did and in the band, Mambesak. Mambesak in Biak language is bed of paradise. So it, it makes me understand that language is very important, very much important and that connection. And so looking at the, um, the people and the Malay, Papuan Malay language is, is common now that we're speaking um, that Papuan, very thick Papuan Malay, but when you travel further to the uh, west from the archipelago of Indonesia, like Maluku and then the Flobamora, all the spices islands that, um, um, yeah, the, the Europeans came and really used the space like within the, um, the Dutch um, East Indies, where, what they call back then. And so that's how the language travels. But for us, one thing that is of significant it is the kinship system that really intact. So when we look at it from language, when we look at it from um, the migration story, whether it's the sound, 
or whether it's the song line or blood lines, that kinship system is very much critical. It's entwined in our everyday life. So, and that is also with the family names. And so that's how also the language travels. So when we travel across from West Papua into Papua New Guinea, that family name, it does identifies as well. Um, and so the, it's also goes through the songs. So there are songs that traditional ancient um, songs that it, it travels through on that North Coast, right down. And even just the sound of the drum, the drum beat, um, as I highlighted earlier, we follow that. So from where I come from, there is distinct sound that I know it will be different to the Southern part of um, Papua. And when you travel across down all the way to Torres Strait Island, the sound change a bit, which I'm happy to give a bit of an indication here or just uh, on my album display. So from my island or from the top end, north part, um, our beat, it's, um, it goes like this. So it's got And then once you go, you go down south, it's go, it's changed. It's go change a bit. And then when you go down to Torres Strait, it goes slow. That's Torres Strait. And so, and then when I we go further to the most eastern part in the Melanesia, a French um, cook territory, um, Kanaki, New Caledonia, they go slower then. The, the sound changes. Kanak music. So that in itself, that's how we can identify. We follow that sound. And so we can tell the difference that, that where it comes from and that family, that kinship system that, yeah. Anyway, I'll probably stop here. <laughs> No, that's really interesting. Thank you. I did not know that. I think it was very enlightening as well. Um, so, so how much, so obviously we know about the things that happened in the 70s and the um, forced acculturation. Um, how much is that still um, affecting West Papuan people? And how much would you say Indonesian culture has penetrated West Papuan culture? Um, and what is there to do to um, maybe resist that? Between 70s up until um, the downfall of Suharto, certainly there was a lot of um, the repression and the suppression of um, cultural activities, the move, the resistance itself. And, and so it was an, a lot of room to really um, capture the works that, yeah, um, and in the 80s, particularly where my parents have to flee um, was Papua. So 84 was a massive exodus of um, Papuans from West Papua across to PNG. And between that period as well, um, we lost a lot of some of the brightest um, in West Papua. And so like Arno Lapp, who went around and captured and they were educated under the Dutch um, system and well versed and very much at the time, yeah, West Papua was in it well advanced in terms of the decolonization process was pretty much ready to be a, an, a, an independent um, nation state. And so uh, that was happening. And so the culture, the language, and the ways of thinking, um, basically, was Papua was Indonesianized um, during that period. But after the fall of Suharto in 98, 99, and the change of government, um, it's, it was different. Um, people see the Papuan Spring. There was, after the Timor-Leste case, um, the referendum, and so there was a new, renewed hope for West Papua. Um, so in 2000, that is when um, the nonviolence um, struggle kind of picks up from that and mobilizing and building um, solidarity through the students' network in Indonesia and throughout Indonesia. And even until today, we're seeing a lot of um, the Indonesian students and with the social media now, 
um, many have kind of like been exposed to read what is happening. And so they came to also hear and read about West Papua. So we saw that with the Papuan Lives Matter, since after the 2019 and 2020 um, um, George uh, Floyd's case, students across Indonesia have come out now and really um, become advocates on human rights situation and even environmental and even questioning their governments. And we're seeing even many of the um, in students, activists got arrested, got detained. Um, Surya Anta is one of the, an example where he is now the spokesperson for the, the free West Papua or front Rakyat Indonesia. It's the front um, um, Indonesian movement, student movement for West Papua. And he was detained in 2019 for simply um, um, advoc advocating on, um, yeah, against racism. And we're seeing that even Indonesian human, um, human rights lawyer, Veronica Coman, who came to study in Australia, just for advocating for um, activists, um, yeah, um, labeled as the enemy of the state or enemy of Indonesia. Um, even towards end of last year, her parents' um, home were blasted with bomb in front of their homes just for uh, her speaking up. So we're seeing the changes. There's a transition within the younger uh, uh, Indonesians and the support through that in, in really um, owning our narrative. And so that's the work that I do as well um, with, within the um, cultural spaces and arts is to own our narrative and so really reclaiming that narrative as well. So that's really key in what I do as well. So when we talk about the band, Sorong Samurai, that's also kind of like psychologically breaking that arbitrary line that separates West Papua and Papua New Guinea, but looking at it from that that cultural lens that we are one people, um, we share one language, one land, one one water, salt water. So that Sorong Samurai really speaks of that, um, breaking that, um, yeah, narrative from um, colonial um, lens.